What's up guys, it's Fedor, and today I wanna to share my secrets around life tells. I did a module on this in my masterclass for Poker Code, but I wanna take out some of the highlights and make a really cool YouTube video on the key things I look at when I play live poker and how I exploit other players and what the main things are that I can extract from it. Now, I believe as a baseline, tells and live reads are a super overlooked and fundamental thing of live poker because especially if you get better at poker and if you're on a really high level, there is so much you can draw from how people behave and also when you have played a lot of volume. Such an important part is having played thousands or tens of thousands of live hands and having met thousands and tens of thousands of opponents. I don't know what the exact number is, but I probably have played against tens of thousands of different live opponents just because tables mix and I've played um, so many live poker tournaments and patterns repeat. So to start right away, there is no one solution for live tells. There's not one thing you can see and that means this thing. At least I don't think so. I think the context is always important, but there are situations that can come together that make you lead towards one outcome really strongly to make that very likely that they have a really strong hand or a really weak hand. And this type of information, even though it's not final and not absolute, is so important to take into consideration because you will make better decisions in the long run if your interpretation is somewhat accurate. So I wanna give you some insights into what I'm looking for, what the key aspects are that I'm looking out for and how I exploit it in the end. Now I generally make a differentiation in three different parts. One is background. I'll explain on what that means. Second is poker related tells and third is body related tells. And then I try to piece them together to come to a conclusion. The experience I have made is that the more you can put pictures together, the better idea you get in the end. Because oftentimes it's actually very insightful to get contradicting input or additional input from different angles. Now let me explain and jump right into the first thing, what I mean by background information. A lot of information is hidden before you even start playing poker with other people. And I try to actively look out for that. WSOP main event is a fantastic example. I don't know 7,000 of the 8,000 players who are playing or maybe a bit less, but I know quite some, but I don't know a lot of them. And yet I have a read on every single player. How's that possible? The only way it's possible is that there are population reads and who they are not is also a big read. If there is a 50 year old American guy who I figure out won his seat in his home game satellite, then I know he's not an online professional. That already in itself is such an important information. So I think people always overlook the information that's hidden in who they're not or who their opponents are not, rather than trying to look out exactly who they are. Knowing that he's not a top online professional already makes me exclude a lot of things that I believe he might do. So if this player is overbetting, it's unlikely that he has studied this spot and that he knows that he should have this or that he knows about a potential balanced approach and will have bluffs there. It's most likely that he just has a strong hand and wants to extract value. And I make concrete examples so that it's easier to understand why this is valuable. If he is in a spot where um, he bets and I think he doesn't really have intuitive bluffs so he would have needed to study this spot to know which type of hands to bluff then I think that he's very likely to have a really strong hand just because from knowing that I think he probably hasn't studied like an online professional has. Knowing in which category people fall is really important and now let's get to the concrete categories. So if you want to profile your opponents you need to be looking for what type of characters they are and what characteristics they have because that will translate directly to their game of poker, especially if they're less studied. So one of the key things I'm looking for is, are there more on the ego-driven aggression side who will try to fight back? Or are there more on the conservative passive side where they will reclude? These are the main categories I try to go into without getting too much specific, because I believe that will show directly within their play style. Someone who's more on the passive side will take a step back when you show a lot of aggression. They will not necessarily try to fight back. They will not 
try to win the pot at every cost. They will not try to pick you off if necessary. They will just go out of your way and most likely play strong hands. So when they fight back, then you can easily give up. And especially with such an aggressive play style that I have, I think it's really important to identify these different characteristics before the game starts. So I start to make conversation with people to try to figure out what character they are. Are they extremely outgoing? Are they wearing accessories? Do they wear an expensive watch? Do they feel like they need to show off? Then they're probably more in the aggressive fighting back category. They don't want to be put down. They don't want a 20 year old to uh, beat them. I, they want to show dominance and, and they will try to show that within the game. So when you look at the background information, try to put them into one of these two categories by taking a look at them. How they're dressed, how they appear, how they talk. And I think that will show pretty clearly in their play style. So there is a lot of information already that we can take before the game has even started. Now let's get to the second point, the poker related tells. Here, I wanna focus on two points. One is bet sizing and two is how the chips are being stacked and put in the pot. So I believe these are two very fundamentally important things that made me a lot of money over the time because the one thing that is actually really great representation of how people play is how people stack their chips. When they put their chips really neatly together and very tightly stacked, they're most likely on the more passive side. When they have their chips more loosely and more flying around and further away from each other, especially with less experienced players, that mostly shows a, a more loose or aggressive type of style. So it's easier for them to give away the chips, whereas someone who's more keeping them closer and more stacked together is gonna be a bit more tight with giving them away. I think that actually has been, it's a very simple read, but that has been something that has been valuable for me over time. But something more specific is how people bet and how they put the chips in the pot. Very, very often I've seen that you can deduct strength of the hand from the way they bet. If, for example, they choose a more loosely put together bet sizing, so also in terms of which chips they choose, that tends to be a weaker hand. If they, for example, only have 44,400 chips in their stack and they bet 4,200 in a spot where normally maybe they should be betting more, that generally speaks for a weaker hand in my opinion. People are more thoughtful with stronger hands when it's about bet sizing or chips they're using. Also one thing is when they bet 6,600 and they could be using bigger chips and they bet it with smaller chips, it's also been a rather reliable tell for people to have weaker hands when they use the more loosely put together chips or the smaller denomination. So there are quite some things within bet sizing and how people choose bet sizings that can give you quite some information, especially when people are less experienced. I would say generally for these type of tells, the more experienced people are, um, the less they, I value them. But that's just a side note. So regarding bet sizings and bets in general, the main thing that I would say here that has me made hundreds of thousands of dollars is looking at the exact bets people are putting out in percentage of the pot. Because online people have buttons and they can click exactly 33% and 66%, but you will see there are these subconscious drivers in players to choose one over the other size. So if someone is betting 60% on the turn in a spot where normally he maybe has chosen 70 or 75 or 80% with value, these can be really, really strong tells as to the strength of the hand. Subconsciously, a lot of players, even pros, deviate a little bit in the size of the bet they choose depending on the hand strength they have. When they really want to try to extract value, it will most likely be these two, three nudges above it and when they, have a more speculative hand, it, it's not often that way. So for like the top pros, this doesn't count, but like for a really large part of players on the lower end, this counts a lot, especially with river bets. I have people bet 50% pot or 60% pot on the river. This normally speaks for a pretty capped range with more weaker hands mixed in there, whereas like they're rather large bets, like 75, 80, 90% pot generally are on the stronger end of their range. And when they bet that with their strong hands, and you have seen that repetitively, then also that makes their smaller bets even weaker. So raising against those or, or um, hero calling against those in some spots has been proven to be a very, very successful strategy. So that much to bets. I think there's a lot of value hidden in there, but let's go to the third and biggest category, the body tells. Now I tried to break it down to the things I gained the most from. There's probably hundreds of things you can be looking at. And for me, it's pulse, 
eyes and posture. Mouth plays a role in people's hands and uh, there's lots of other things that I'd be looking at, but I would say these three things are the ones I look at the most and that made me the most money in the long run. Let's start with pulse, which is by far the most important. I think over the years I got pretty good at being able to see someone's standard pulse and then the deviation in the pulse. So that was something I just trained, is just looking at pulses over and over again. I've probably seen thousands of different pulses and their normal pulse and how it increases and how it decreases over time. And the number one thing that I did, especially in riverbeds, is I kind of have an idea of the base pulse of someone. And then they're in an exciting situation, their pulse rises. So let's say they put in a large bet all in on the river in a big spot, they're excited. Their pulse goes up. What happens over time? Does it stay up? Do they get more relaxed? There's more information that flow in there, but this is the key aspect. If someone is excited, like let's say you have a boat, you have the nuts, you go all in on the river, you're really excited because it's a big pot, it's for your tournament life, and then it sinks in after 30 seconds is you can't lose. You know it already, but in that moment it's still exciting and it's for a lot of money and you put all the money in, but then there is something mentally sinking in that relaxes you a little bit and your pulse goes down a little bit. After 30 to 45 seconds, generally you can see that when someone has a really strong hand, there is a slight reduction in the pulse over time. And they are still in a level of excitement because they can win a lot. But there's less stress around being called. There's less stress around busting because they know they can't bust, especially when I take time. They know I don't have a really strong hand. So that is something that is very important to identify there. And now on the other hand, let's say he has king high and he shoves the river as a pure bluff and he's in the same spot. His pulse is really high, he's really excited because it's really scary, he might go out, uh, it's for a lot of money. And now I look at him and I'm thinking and like, it's very visible that I'm maybe not folding and then he gets even more scared or excited and it's just keeping on that level. And there you can see the difference where there's no level of that relaxation because you don't know. He might call, he might put in the chips, maybe I get even closer to putting in the chips and then you get more excited. So there is a difference between the nuts and a bluff and it's subtle because it's not that you're totally relaxed when you have the nuts, you're still excited but you're less afraid from busting. And that is the thing I really try to hone to really get very good at is seeing the difference between someone being scared, excited on a level where he might bust over a longer period of time versus him being excited about winning a big pot with the nuts or a strong hand. And that I think is the number one tell that made me hundreds of thousands of dollars where I was able to bluff catch people in pretty absurd spot with hands that I would never call online, for example. So looking out for this disparity between the pulse of a person when they're afraid to bust versus excited to win a big pot. That is my number one tell in terms of pulse. Now I mentioned eyes. Eyes are really, really big in life tests as well because there is blinking involved. It's where you look. It's giving so much context. So eyes are sometimes important by themselves, but also really important in the context of different things. With eyes, it's the hardest for me to, to give a specific tell as to what I, what I take from there or how it's valuable. It's really more how people have their eye style or like how they use their eyes or where they look. And there are some patterns that I learned over the years where there are certain patterns that more speak for strength to me and some that speak for weakness. So really try to observe the personal pattern of a player of where they go with their eyes. Generally, what you can see is there is a difference. And now this is really hard for me to just explain between someone actually locking their eyes and being in defense mode because that's just their reaction and someone consciously choosing to lock their eyes somewhere. My experience is if they're consciously choosing to lock their eyes somewhere, it's generally a strong hand because they are aware of they should do that to keep a posture, but they actually rather relax or kind of know what they're doing. Whereas the first part is mostly a bluff where they're actually really uncomfortable. And there is something in the way people look and the way um, they have their head tilted in a way they look that, that gives that away. If you keep out looking for that, you will see more and more of that pattern where people have a more relaxed eye vision that is held somewhere versus like a more scared animalistic type of, um, well, okay, I really like need to stop and do nothing right now. And that's a pretty strong 
tell regarding eyes. Another is regarding blinking. I would also generally say that some players, few players have it that they blink a lot when they're, when they're weak, but generally I would say when people start to blink less, I see that more as a sign of weakness as well. Um, and when they have a more relaxed blinking, that's more a sign of relaxation and strength. Um, but that is something very individual. As I said in the beginning, you can't just say, oh, this, is, this counts for everyone. It's just that I've seen that um, there are different styles and different types for people. And especially when I play more often with someone, this has really, really helped me in the past. One shout out, a very specific tell I can actually mention here is, and this kind of ties in with number three, posture, how people look, their eyes, as I always want to give some, some background and information is a really, really strong tell I have is on people seeing when they think. So this one goes to Ike Axon. He always timed things. He always tried to keep in the same time of things. And so he had this look that he put on around the time. So let's say he always takes 10 to 15 seconds. He shuffles, he randomizes, and then he does something. And there are spots where I can see in his face if he's actually thinking or not thinking, or at least I believe so. So there is a difference between a brain working and, and how a face looks when a brain is working and a brain that already knows what it's doing and is waiting. It's just two different postures, it's two different types of faces. You can see in my face if I'm thinking or if I'm waiting. And that differentiation helped me a lot because if I know he knows what he will do, that rules out some hands. Because there are certain spots where you know you need to think. You know, I know it will be somewhat of a new spot for him or it's a difficult decision. And if I know he has an easy decision, then I can rule out some hands. And that actually has been a pretty reliable tell, I believe, in, in countless situations with a couple of players who have a similar style. So making this uh, very specific as to why eyes and, and posture matter even on the highest level. The slouching, I would say, is, is generally also something rather weak. Also, if people are more relaxed, more relaxed in their shoulders, generally more type of strength. Number one thing, if people drink while they play a hand, I think uh, 18 out of 18, I have seen it, they always have it. So whatever you talk yourself into, don't call them when they take a zip of their drink. Might also be one of the best reverse tells in history to try to drink something when you play a hand. And um, these are the key aspects of what I see within live poker. Um, some of my secrets around live tells and what I have been looking for and what made me a lot of money playing live poker. I hope this was helpful for you. I hope you enjoyed my secrets to live poker. If you liked it, leave a subscribe. We will keep you informed around all the videos that are coming up. I wish you a wonderful week. Cheers, Fedor.